Well, now, um, health and safety announcements. We've had a couple of them already, but uh, no circus-related event uh, uh, can begin without some health and safety announcements. Uh, indeed, some shows like Tumble Circus and its host Ken Fanning, who I don't think is here. Oh, he is. Sorry, Ken, didn't see you there. Um, uh, indeed, um, do a particularly interesting version of health and safety announcements, but I, I'll not spoil the joke in case Ken's intending to use it again in their forthcoming season in Writers Square, opposite to Nance Cathedral, in December. Yes, Ken? Nice. Okay, that's the plug. Um, so, here are my health and safety announcements for this particular talk. Whoever is foolish enough to attempt to write a history of the circus and of circus families will perish in a madhouse. <laughs> and the second one. Circus history and circus mythology have become very much entwined. The memories, testimonies and handbells and posters which constitute the clues to its history and its development frequently demonstrate enough cavalier indulgence of fancy over fact to make an occasional grab grind out of the investigator. So those are two of my favourite warnings, health warnings if you like, from circus historians John L. Clark and Helen Stoddart. Now for a question. As a former teacher and teacher educator, inevitably I begin any talk with a question or some questions. If you're familiar with this building and its splendid atrium and staircase, uh, you uh, will perhaps have noticed as you ascended the staircase or descended the staircase um, an interesting group of male and female acrobats uh, featured in a pyramid in that large-scale photograph at the top of the stairs. Have you ever wondered who they were? Perhaps you have. Perhaps you haven't even noticed them. But the next time you're climbing the stairs, then by all means, uh, have a look at them. Can we give them names? Who is the man with the goatee beard standing on the drawbar, drawbar of a wagon behind them? Who took the photograph? And where was it taken? Well, by the end of this session, this afternoon, I think you will know the solution to these mysteries. And therefore, from now on, whenever you come to Prony again, particularly if you bring visitors here who haven't been, you'll be able to impress your fellow visitors with the depth of your knowledge about the building and its fabulous design. Um, interestingly, purely coincidentally, the internal design, the work of artist, Belfast artist Rhea Duffy, no relation, I think, of the famous Duffy Circus family, but it's an interesting coincidence. Well, the official title of this talk is Another Little Trouble Over, the Unique Characteristics of the Circus in Victorian and Edwardian Ireland. In the later Victorian and Edwardian years, and on into the post-First World War period, circuses were undoubtedly the form of professional popular entertainment which had by far the largest following in the towns, villages and rural areas of Ireland. Indeed, as late as 1956, as we saw in the movie sequence, the arrival of a circus in a city, Derry, created obviously huge interest. I mean, the, the numbers of people you saw there on the foil bridge uh, watching those elephants, uh, quite incredible. The travelling fit-up companies uh, were perhaps the only serious rivals uh, to the circus in rural Ireland. And that was especially true when after 1900 these fit-up companies augmented their combination of variety acts and the performance of melodramas like the classic East Lynn with brief exhibitions of moving pictures then in their infancy. A tactic which even the John Duffy Circus itself briefly adopted in 1907. The circus as a form of entertainment even survived the advent later on of permanent cinemas, whereas many of the fit-up companies, deprived of their virtual monopoly on the new cinematic technological marvel, did not. Even the Courtney family, who in the 1950s and early 1960s toured one of the last fit-up variety roadshows 
in the rural areas of West Ulster were eventually persuaded to move into the more lucrative circus business instead. And as you may know, the Courtney family, or branches of them, now operate Circus Vegas, uh, currently touring not in Ireland at the moment, uh, but in uh, England, and also Wayne Courtney's Circus World uh, on tour in Southern Ireland as we speak. Um, in recent years there's been a rediscovery by academics of the almost lost world of popular culture in the Victorian and Edwardian periods. Now, um, this work has, for example, focused on aspects of the circus, the equestrian melodrama, the fairground, the freak show, and the music hall in both Britain and the USA. These forms of entertainment have rightly been seen as having been influential in both reflecting and also reinforcing popular attitudes and opinions on a whole range of social and political issues from class relationships to imperialism and perhaps even the enthusiasm for recruitment in 1914 at the commencement of World War I. Indeed, my colleague Helen Averley, who's sitting on the front row over there, whom you'll hear from later, who's published a magnificent source book on the, the First World War and the circus, has speculated in that book as to the extent to which uh, the spectacles and the productions which circuses put on before 1914 which were always patriotic in nature, whether we're talking about Britain or Germany, whether uh, those had an effect on popular attitudes towards war, towards uh, rushing to join the colours, etc., etc. It's an interesting thought. The more traditional emphasis on the history of what one might call the legitimate theatre has come to be seen by some historians, not by all, um, as rather narrowly conceived given the relatively limited geographical, numerical, and class appeal of such traditional forms of drama, which only flourish in the larger urban areas, in, uh, urban centres in Ireland. Apart from a few brief references, relatively little academic attention has to date been paid to these aspects of popular culture in Ireland. With the notable exception of Mark Phelan's work, Mark Phelan of Queen's University Drama Department, Mark Phelan's work on the history of the theatre, the popular aspect of theatre, Helen Burke's account of uh, Philip Astley's early circus ventures in Dublin. There are, there are of course, mentions of Astley as well in the various biographies uh, that have been published on him, notably in this, the 250th year of the Astley um, anniversary. And also, the University of Limerick and uh, Michael O'Hare um, and Tony McCarthy have done some work on uh, Irish circus history, and indeed, there's one of the books that they've been involved with sitting over there on, on the table. <coughs> but relatively little academic work has been done compared to Britain or the United States on these aspects of popular culture. There's been a lot of focus, of course on the interconnections between high drama in Ireland and early 20th century political developments like the Easter Rising. Much has been written about John Millington Singh, Lady Gregory, W.B. Yeats, Sean O'Casey, the evolution of the Abbey Theatre, all of that stuff. But to the inhabitants of the rural districts around Banbridge, County Down, or Tralee, County Kerry in the 19th century, many of whom had never strayed beyond the markets and fairs of their nearby town, the Belfast and Dublin theatres and their controversies were remote and irrelevant to their largely humdrum lives. Hence the importance of the circus. With its lurid posters, its colourful street parade in those days, brightly, brightly painted wagons drawn by teams of horses, and in some cases, although not very often in 19th century Ireland, a travelling menagerie of unfamiliar animals, all introducing an element of the exotic uh, into their lives. The excitement of the circus <coughs> coming to town in the 1880s is very effectively captured by the newspaper columnist J.J. Scollin, reminiscing about his boyhood 
in an article in the Dublin Evening Herald in 1926. What days of joy those were in the northern town, he lived in his early years somewhere in the north of Ireland, when with loud cracking of whips, shouting drivers of foreign hands perched high up on the boxes of mighty flashing gilded coaches drove on to the fair green for a one-day visit of a travelling circus. Such fine horses as those were, such great men and such beautiful women. The delight of joyful anticipation was in every juvenile heart. What a great honour it was to help the elephants keepers to water and feed their charges. What boy would not give his last penny to help bed down the great grumbling dromedary camels. Sublime joy of all was the time when one was permitted to bring some of the seats, mere trestles, from the wagons into the big tent, or to throw sawdust on the ring which had been dug by the sweating labourers. Then what palpitating little hearts there were, when the gorgeous bandwagon appeared at the head of the procession, from which issued a blaze of brass, boom of drum, and crash of cymbals. The elephants followed with gaudy howdahs and gaily dressed mahouts, camels with veritable sheiks as their guides, Mounted cages with lions and tigers savagely roaring and snarling behind strong bars, beautifully dressed ladies on prancing steeds, gaily caparisoned horsemen dressed in scarlet and gold, and seated on their little cars drawn by ponies, the comical clowns with white faces, big red noses, and painted lips with their funny little hats, carrying on with gay whimsicalities and merry antics. This is almost certainly a description of one of the few large circuses touring in Ireland in the late 19th century, in the 1870s and the 1880s, called Powell and Clark's Circus. I say that because they were one of the few that had performing animals, uh, as opposed to just horses and dogs, and the references to elephants and so on would suggest that. Morris Hayes, a man known uh, to many of us, I'm sure, in this room, uh, a superb servant of this uh, part of the world uh, during his years in the civil service. Uh, he rose to a very senior level. He sadly died a few months ago. Uh, wrote a wonderful memoir of his childhood in Caloch, County Down, uh, where he was brought up in the early 1930s. And he too reflected similar themes and emotions as the piece I've just read you albeit perhaps in a slightly more critical way than J.J. Scullin's somewhat rose-tinted view. All that had changed by the 1930s from the 1880s was the advent of the steam traction engine as a new beast of burden and the replacement of flickering naphtha flares, which were the main source of heat and illumination on the circus tent in the Victorian and Edwardian period, highly dangerous, uh, but uh, obviously health and safety wasn't an issue then. <laughs> Flickering naphtha flares have been replaced with less than reliable in the early days electric lighting inside the big top. The role of the circus as a brief, colourful interruption to the stultifying boredom of small time life remained constant. Duffy's Circus, he writes, was another diversion which came for one day a year to a field at the end of Powell Lane. This is in Colour. <coughs> Duffy's Circus, larger than all the multiple bespoke circuses in Ireland combined, whatever that meant, whatever it means now. Or it might have been Heckenbergs or Fossets or some pale, diluted group of younger Duffies, John instead of James or brothers instead of just one. But Duffy's was the name that dominated memory and defined the very name of circus, however mean and tawdry, and fulfilled the promise of the big top on trapeze artists and jugglers and clowns in the sawdust ring. It was a momentary injection of life and colour, however false, into the greyness of village life by transients who moved in from a magic nowhere, put up their caravans and tents for a day, gave their performance, and then travelled out of our world over the quarter hill and into an imagined oblivion. The ritual was always the same. The appearance of lurid posters stuck on trees and gates and bare stone walls about a week before the event, then the lumbering trailers drawn by a traction engine early in the morning, 
and on the way to school the great tent poles being raised by gangs of men with ropes. At lunchtime the tent could be seen, a canvas roof with open sides and tiered wooden seats. At about four o'clock the procession up the street, I think his memory is faulty there, it would have been earlier than that. At about four o'clock the procession up the street with horse-drawn caravans driven by exotic gypsy ladies and strong men marching dressed in leopard skins and horse-drawn trailers with moth-eaten lions and tigers dozing in the corner <laughs> and trotting unsaddled horses and ponies which bore little resemblance to the dashing, prancing creatures on the posters. <laughs> After dark, all was magic. Walking in an expectation in the dusk down Castle Street past the rectory up Powell Lane through the muck and gutters at the entrance to John Foy's field, poached by the cattle on track by the wheels and into Fairyland. The traction engine flywheel spinning was working a generator to light the tent, a steam organ was belting out tinny music, the tent was open to those who paid and the show was on. The next morning, on the way to school, the field was bare. Well, as with the great 19th century railroad circuses of the USA, described so well recently by American circus historian Janet Davis, uh, so with the sm much smaller tenting Irish mud shows of 19th and early 20th century years, the concept of circus day as a holiday became firmly established. Indeed, both of these kinds of shows, whether in Pittsburgh or Portadown, usually presented their wares for one day and one day only, except in the largest centres, and their patrons were expected to adjust their lives and their routines accordingly. My late mother always told me a story about life on her farm in Island McGee near Whitehead, and normally the annual visit of Duffy's Circus to Whitehead coincided with haymaking. And she recalled that very often the labourers in the farm would try to argue that the hay was too wet, <laughs> that it should be left for another day or two. Uh, because, of course, uh, John Duffy's circus was in Whitehead that, that, that day for one day only. And if they were making the hay, they would miss it. So, uh, contemporary Irish writers such as John Millington Singh also remarked on the wide social appeal of the circus, a feature also recently highlighted in the English context by uh, University of Swansea historian Brenda Asile. Singh noted during a visit to an unnamed circus on a wet night in Dingle County Kerry how the surging crowd, quote, of wild hillside people, fisherwomen and drunken sailors also <laughs> included some enormous farmer or publican but also little parties of squireens and their daughters in the fashion of five years ago, trying, not always successfully, to reach the shilling seats. As Roisin Kennedy has argued, the paintings and drawings of Singh's sometime collaborator, the artist Jack B. Yates, provide further evidence of the widespread popularity of the circus in this period and of its attraction particularly to Yeats himself, as a subject. Well, let's just think for a moment about the transnational nature of the circus and of circus culture in Ireland and Britain. Circus artists and whole circus companies crisscrossed the Irish Sea in the late 18th, 19th and early 20th centuries with comparative ease, although at least one circus company, that of Benjamin Handy, was shipwrecked and lost uh, in 1797. So it might be assumed that there is little different about the circus in Victorian Ireland and Edwardian Ireland as compared with the rest of the then politically united kingdom. Well, certainly some of the conclusions drawn by British circus and social historians about the positive and negative aspects of the astonishing growth of the Victorian circus industry relate in equal measure to Ireland the liberating impact of the circus industry on the role of women, extremely crucial uh, in the 19th century context. Um, and certainly there's been quite a lot of work done on that. Uh, the uh, liberating impact of the circus industry on transsexual performers, on black performers, 
these, the, these issues again apply equally to Britain and Ireland. Indeed, I, I've printed off and brought along there um, uh, an example of um, uh, Pablo Fanke, uh, a black circus proprietor in the 19th century, um, touring both in Britain and in Ireland. Um, he eventually died and is buried, I think, Kevin and Leeds, I guess it's, it's burning ground. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, certainly those particular groups marginalized the times in the Victorian period were uh, uh, certainly liberated to a degree by the circus. Equally, the use of child performers was very controversial both in Britain and in Ireland, and there was legislation around that issue, ultimately. The Irish Sea was no barrier to the organisation and business skills of circus entrepreneurs, or to the success of these entrepreneurs in marketing the circus, despite its turbulent fairground origins to all social classes as a morally wholesome form of entertainment, particularly as compared to the music hall with its alcoholic associations. The role of elaborate street parades in a less hurried and more traffic-free age, in dramatically publicizing circus performances, the emphasis on equestrian melodramas, the use of temporary wooden buildings for circuses in larger centers, such as Belfast and Dublin, and often these buildings have serious public safety issues, and uh, uh, serious fires and disasters were not unknown. The appeal of demonstrations of equestrian skills to rural audiences who were themselves part of a horse-based culture of that time, and the increasing employment by larger circuses in Britain, although much less so in Ireland, as the 19th century progressed, of exotic animals to sustain audience interest, all of these things are just as integral to the Irish circus scene as to the British in the Victorian period. However, in Ireland, uh, as on occasions in Britain, perhaps predictably, there were some reservations amongst audiences about the prominent role played by female performers, and especially about the relatively risque nature of their ring costumes. I came across a poem, not a great poem, by a guy called J. W. Montgomery, who was actually the former master of Billyborough Workhouse in County Cavan, and Clark to the Poor Law Board, uh, Board of Guardians in Dine Patrick. <clears throat> he was a bit of an amateur poet, uh, and he wrote a, poet, a poem called uh, The Circus uh, in uh, 1887 in a volume called Fireside Lyrics. Um, and here's what he has to say radiating Victorian bourgeois morality, of course, as well as gender prejudice, because the poem's addressed to uh, a male audience, and also exhibiting a tendency to treat a dwarf performer as something of a freak of nature. The circus, what a brilliant sight! Fine horsemanship was there, sir. Fine ladies, too, rode around the ring. Of clothing, somewhat bare, sir. These boldly dashed through paper hoops, displaying feats of daring, and posed in many a curious way to keep the youngsters staring. One man could play with glittering knives as though they were but toys, sir. Another one could fling the balls, two handsome, fling like balls, sorry, two handsome little boys, sir. My friends were much amused to see the dwarf of big men rushing. But ah, those ladies, semi-clad, they kept some females blushing. Their after peace was but a sham, unworthy to be seen, sir. They must have thought their audience here was truly very green, sir. But when they come to town again, they surely must display less of female charms, or much I fear some female friends will pay less. I keep struggling for a little <coughs> at the end there. But basically, um, we get the message. He wasn't happy <coughs> as a, a true blue Victorian with a female costume in the ring. But it was political loyalties, and I'm basically a political historian, really. Uh, it was political loyalties in the Irish context which gave circus proprietors and performers the most serious problems. Ireland may have been politically united with Britain by the Act of Union at the beginning of the 19th century, but it was by no means an extension of Britain, as Victorian circus owners, 
such as, for example, the Welshman James Lloyd, uh, were to ruefully acknowledge. Philip Astley, the much publicised founder of the modern circus, although he himself never used the term circus to describe his entertainments, uh, somewhat earlier had also discovered some of the uncomfortable facts of Irish political life when he extended his circus operations begun in London in 1768 uh, to his Peter Street Royal Amphitheatre, note the name Royal Amphitheatre, in Dublin in 1789. Circus historian George Spate has argued that Astley made the first of what were to become yearly visits to Dublin as early as 1773, uh, which is only five years after his first attempt in London, as early as 1773 when he played uh, in an open-air riding school on the Inns Keys. Um, and other writers have uh, made similar uh, statements. While Astley is usually credited with bringing the circus as a form of entertainment to Ireland, uh, in this space close to what now would be the Four Courts building, it has been suggested by some writers for example, George Spate again, that it may in fact have been actually an Irishman who invented the modern circus, not Philip Astley at all. Uh, an Irish riding master, Thomas Johnson, was the first to demonstrate equestrian skills to the London paying public in a field adjoining the Three Hats in Islington in 1758, ten years before Astley first set up his riding school at Halfpenny Hatch on the southern bank of the River Thames, close to Westminster Bridge. However, Astley certainly was the first to add other elements to a basic display of equestrian skills in what then became a standardised institutional format. Astley was a veteran of the Seven Years' War, uh, the Seven Years' War with France. He was a bluff, choleric, uh, somewhat angry at times, ex-cavalry sergeant major, with all a characterised you might expect of an ex-sergeant major, who was not noted for his political sensitivity. When the United Kingdom went to war with France in 1793, in February 1793, Astley was keen to do his patriotic propagandist duty. And as Helen Burke of Florida State University has recently shown, the site of Ireland's first permanent circus building, Astley's Dublin Royal Amphitheatre, in Peter Street, Dublin, was rocked by disturbances and riots in the 1790s. Astley's loyalist, colonialist, patriotic equestrian dramas were encouraged by a Dublin Castle administration fearful of the spread of the French revolutionary virus to Ireland. These spectacles, popular with London audiences, were increasingly disrupted in Dublin by supporters of the United Irishmen, culminating in the riots in and around the Peter Street Amphitheatre, quite uh, serious riots, in December 1797, the year before the 98 Rebellion. So thus began the enduring link between the circus uh, in Ireland and sporadically, uh, politically, sporadic, politically motivated violence. It is particularly interesting that the playing and singing of contentious songs and anthems proved to be a notably incendiary ingredient of these events. God Save the King may have gone down well with London audiences, but a section of the Dublin audience much preferred Patrick's Day, then regarded as Ireland's unofficial national anthem. The ex-Sergeant Major poured further fuel on the flames in 1797, leading directly to the riots with a nightly rendition of Croppies Lie Down, <laughs> the anthem at this time of the rebel hunting crown forces throughout Ireland. Uh, as you may know, the reference to croppies, French revolutionaries cropped their hair. Um, that was the French revolutionary fashion. And so their sympathisers and supporters in Ireland were, were often seen doing the same. So, hence the, the title of that particular ditty, Croppies Lie Down. Okay, so if Astley didn't create the circus, uh, in terms of the actual word uh, for his entertainment, who did? Who created the term circus? 
Well, the answer is to be found in this 1784 uh, newspaper advertisement that you see on the screen. You'll notice that it refers to um, uh, an event in Dublin, uh, some rivals of Astley, uh, in fact former pupils, uh, Jones and Parker, from the Royal Circus St George's Field, London. That was a stone built building in London that uh, was established some years after Astley's uh, original construction, was a rival to him uh, and to his operations, and it actually used the term circus, which at that time was probably just a, a reference to a kind of street layout or um, you know, the Royal Circus in Bath, for example, uh, it was a sort of circular space. So the term Royal Circus uh, was the first uh, use of that term, circus, um, for that particular building by its joint uh, owners, Charles Hughes and Charles Dibden, who had erected it in 1772. Um, Charles Hughes is a fascinating man. Uh, led a circus company on a widespread tour of Europe uh, wasn't very good at managing money. Uh, according to some stories, May, along with many Imperial Guardsmen, uh, been in bed with Catherine the Great, but we know absolute proof of that. <laughs> Catherine, <laughs> Catherine got through a lot of men. Uh, she was getting a bit old by the time Charles Hughes was in St. Petersburg, so he may be, he may be a bit of a circus value. Anyway, uh, but this is an interesting uh, uh, example of a rival of Astley's coming to Dublin, um, in, in 1784 and um, performing on a different site, the one Ashley had used originally or indeed the one in which he, he built his more permanent amphitheatre. Um, Ashley built amphitheatres lots of places, indeed he was often given the nickname uh, uh, Amphi Astley because he was so keen on building amphitheatres uh, here, there and everywhere. So, um, uh, that's uh, the answer to that particular um, uh, question. I want to say a little bit, just briefly, about uh, clowns and clowning, uh, because it's quite uh, important. While the selection of music and song generally continued to create certain risks for circus proprietors in Ireland on into the 19th century, especially if they lacked local knowledge or political sensitivity, the individual who was perhaps most in the firing line was inevitably the circus clown. And of course, uh, clowning originated, uh, strictly speaking, not in the circus, but in theatres, from the Commedia dell'arte tradition, um, and in pantomimes. This is a, an early um, uh, illustration of two pantomime clowns mocking each other, the most famous pantomime clown was, of course, Joseph Grimaldi, from where the term joy, as a, as a generic term for clowns, came from. Um, that dates from 1822. Grimaldi actually probably did appear in, in theatres in Dublin, but of course he was never uh, in a circus. But um, this is actually one of the wonderful um, pieces of art currently on exhibition in the National Gallery of Ireland in their Circus 250 show, the uh, special um, exhibition they put on called The Art of the Show from their holdings and uh, that's just one, one little sample of it. There are a few leaflets over on the table there about it. It's still running into October. So clowns were particularly, I think, in the firing line. And of course we've got to understand that clowns in the Victorian and Edwardian period were rather different from clowns today. Uh, um, uh, they, uh, they, they, they were uh, much more uh, oral in terms of their, um, as well as uh, visual, in terms of their clowning. Um, there are many more words uh, than there would be today, and often songs as well, um, which is an important point. So Victorian clowning was rather different compared to the slapstick and the largely visual comedy uh, favoured by most circus clowns from the mid 20th century uh, onwards. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, the clown was a particularly vulnerable figure in another way in 
um, 19th century circuses because uh, usually they were the lowest of the low in terms of the circus pecking order and in terms of uh, payment and salaries. Um, indeed, they often didn't get salaries, um, uh, or if they did, they were mainly relying on so-called benefit nights, where performances were put on and a share of the proceeds were given to them. And uh, uh, therefore, they were usually uh, not terribly successful financially, often ending up in the workhouse at the end of their lives. But this low status, um, um, as I say, was, was, was quite a common feature. But the circus ring was nonetheless a key site for mocking the social hierarchy and for turning it upside down, at least temporarily, a process to which, as one writer has put it, the clown's subversiveness made a crucial contribution. And this, in fact, reminds us that particularly in the evening performances, most Victorian circus audiences would be adults. This was not a children's entertainment as such. It was an entertainment for all ages, and therefore political satire uh, from clowning and clowns uh, had an audience. Uh, and some research has been done by academic colleagues on the kind of gags that the clowns would have used uh, the, the kind of poems and verses that they would have recited, um, uh, monologues, uh, new and traditional songs. So this is far removed from the often uh, rather repetitive uh, cliches, comic cliches of uh, clown entre entrees and run-ins today. Um, clowns had to be much more original uh, than uh, perhaps they are in some cases today, where they tend to copy each other's routines uh, endlessly. Um, so, uh, to some extent, the boundaries between the circus ring and the music hall stage in the 19th century were extremely porous. Um, the same was true of the early circus in America, but once the circuit got big in America and three rings came in and so on, that kind of oral clowning and satire was lost. Um, probably uh, the last of the singing clowns in Ireland was a guy called Johnny Quinn who continued the tradition into the 1930s. Some items from my own collection over there, uh, old uh, programs from the late 1930s of John Duffy's included a songbook uh, so you could sing along with the, the clown uh, in, in the ring. So what can we say then about um, the further developments of the of the, the circus. Well, in the 19th century, um, obviously the early 19th century, the circus was still mainly an indoor phenomenon. Uh, here is Astley's Amphitheatre in London, described by Dickens and others, of course, uh, as it was in the 1850s, uh, still very much a, a, a wooden building. But here's an interesting painting by a Scottish painter of Donnybrook Fair in Dublin, 1856. Uh, Fair eventually suppressed for uh, uh, moral reasons and because of uh, drunkenness, faction fighting, and licentiousness generally. Uh, uh, many of these fairs were suppressed both in Britain and in Ireland. I think the Catholic Church built a church eventually on part of the site just to sort of reinforce the moral message. But this is a Scottish painter, Erskine Nicol. He painted quite a lot of famine scenes in the 1840s. He taught art in Dublin in that period, uh, from Edinburgh originally. Um, if you look at the detail on this painting, you can see a tent and a show front. And if you can read it, it says Bell's American Circus. Um, this may be, and I'm hesitating here, this may be the first visual representation of a circus tent in Ireland. Um, obviously a little bit before photography. If we get to photography, then uh, this is the earliest photograph I've been able to find. It's a photograph of Powell and Clark's Paragon Circus somewhere in Ireland in the late 1870s. 
Uh, again, notice the one pole tent. Notice the smaller tents, a lot of artists and staff slept in tents or on straw bales in the stable tents. Notice the parade wagon there and other wagons uh, drawn up. This is a, a, a fairly big uh, show. Uh, was one of the biggest turning Ireland in the 19th century. And here is James Lloyd, the owner of Lloyd's Mexican Circus, uh, who wasn't a Mexican circus at all, he was actually Welsh, um, a, uh, a Welsh Protestant, uh, who owned uh, a touring show. His two sons were very famous for a wire act in which they played violins while balancing, balancing on the tight wire um, in tune, I think. Uh, but he wrote a, a circus memoir in 1925, which is a very important source if you want to look at what um, uh, circus life, uh, turning circus life was uh, uh, like in Ireland in uh, the 19th century. Uh, and uh, uh, he has lots of wonderful stories, but many of them feature the problems that politics created. Um, for example, uh, at a performance in Coleraine, his German circus band, which normally ended the show with Yankee Doodle Dandy, duly played Yankee Doodle Dandy, uh, Dandy as usual. The crowd almost then started to riot, shouting and chanting, well, where's the national anthem? Mm -hmm. This is Coleraine. <laughs> so, uh, in order to prevent the tent being wrecked, Lloyd had to dash into his wagon, produce his own cornet, which he could play, rush into the ring, play the national anthem on the cornet <laughs> to calm things down. Uh, or uh, if uh, there were other problems, there were, uh, he, he records a street parade in Milton Malbay where some of the performers were wearing orange costumes near riot. <laughs> um, uh, he, recall, he records other difficulties. Being in Uri in 1886 during the uh, debates around the first home rule bill when uh, uh, every house had either an orange tar barrel or a green tar barrel outside it ready to light depending on whether the bill passed or failed. Uh, well, the bill failed of course in 1886 uh, and uh, Lloyd managed to get out of town. He said he was lucky they were only stoned uh, as they passed through the Catholic section of Newry because obviously the bill had been defeated. And they, uh, uh, you know, this was a sort of hostage to fortune situation that he was in uh, uh, quite frequently. Uh, but uh, he made a lot of money as well um, and kept the company going by issuing tots of rum from time to time um, because obviously there were all sorts of other problems like weather and so on and so forth. So there are lots of good stories about um, the political difficulties uh, that faced uh, the Victorian and Edwardian uh, circus in Ireland. Here's a Powell and Clark poster for probably the most famous 19th century clown. I've researched his career, written about him, uh, who died. There's a whole Victorian murder mystery here, but it's another lecture. Um, uh, uh, Johnny Patterson. This is his address to the people of Ireland after his return from the United States, where he had been a big success. He, he um, died in mysterious circumstances in Tralee. Uh, uh, was he murdered or was he not? Well, you know, have to invite me back on uh, pretty my uh, findings on that one. And here's Jack Yates painting of him, singing one of his famous songs. Remember what I was saying about songs and ballads? Patterson composed a whole series of ballads. Some of them maybe you know. A famous emigrant ballad called Johnny Deer, or uh, The Stone Outside Dan Murphy's Door. Um, uh, Bridget Donoghue was probably his most famous uh, and uh, Yeats had seen him as a boy and then uh, <coughs> much later painted him because for Yeats the clown was a kind of metaphor of the artist. Uh, Yeats saw himself uh, or identified with clowns. Um, he probably saw him with Lloyd actually, with Lloyd's circus uh, or else with Paul and Clark. Um, and then, um, uh, that, that wonderful painting, by the way, is in the Model Art Gallery in Sligo. Um, here's another one that's on, uh, in the Art of the Shoe exhibition in Dublin. 
uh, Francis, Percy Francis Gethin's Travelling Circus, County Clare, early 20th century. Fairly small primitive show. Uh, notice the bandwagon, not at all ornate. The naps, the flares, um, the guy on the Roman rings, uh, and also the fairly primitive seating and the whole kind of laid back atmosphere captured there. Probably this is Turner's Circus. You can't actually identify it exactly from the lettering on the bandwagon, but uh, Joanne Drum, who curated the uh, current NGI exhibition, and I have come to the conclusion that it's a Turner's Circus, which is a small uh, area uh, touring show, well, with Scottish connections. Um, the wonderful Cooper collection in this uh, building. Uh, photographs taken, thousands of plate glass negatives taken by uh, a guy called Burroughs, who later sold his business to Cooper, which is where the Cooper collection title comes from, in and around Straban. Anything that moved in Straban before and after the First World War uh, were captured, was captured by both Burroughs and then Cooper. Um, here is Hanaford's Canadian Circus, the Hanaford family during the First World War eventually moved to the States where they were active in the circus business for many years. Here, here they are preparing for the street parade uh, in Straban around 1910. And uh, here's their ornate bandwagon with the band uh, drawn by an eight horse team. Uh, now I mentioned the acrobats on the stairs. Who were they? How can we know? Well, the show, although you can't work it out from the photograph either on the stairs or this one, was uh, Buff Bill's USA Circus. Uh, was this really Buffalo Bill? No, of course not. This was William Cage, there he is there, with the Buffalo Bill beard. Uh, he uh, used um, uh, the name, and it was quite a well-known name, in 20th century, early 20th century Ireland. So these are members of uh, the Buff Bills Company round about 1911. Uh, and as you see, there are the two ladies and the guys. Now, there was a census of Ireland in 1911, you may or may not know that, um, on the night of the 2nd of April. So imagine the problem the poor old census taker in Ballyclare had, because when he came to Backstreet Ballyclare on the 2nd of April 1911, he found Buff Bill's USA Circus. But his forms, pre-printed, that he was supposed to complete, and then, uh, assumed that he would be working along a street of houses, but instead a number of caravans. So if you look up Backstreet Ballyclare in the 1911 census, you find uh, all of these people recorded their names, their religion, whether they could speak Irish or not. Um, and he, he's quite cleverly written in circus van above the actual printed house number or whatever. Uh, one of them is listed, perhaps the only person in Ireland to be listed in 1911 under occupation as Lion Tamer. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, one of these ladies, um, and I'll, I'll show you another shot, one of these ladies, um, uh, this one here, uh, is the mother of uh, Selena Cage, or Lena Cage, is the mother of 89-year-old uh, Tom Duffy, uh, the patriarch of the present Tom Duffy circuits. Uh, and he and I were able to identify her from that photograph. He was born, of course, in 1929, so wouldn't have been around at this time. Uh, but uh, we were also able to come and go to the stairs in the PRO and uh, let him see um, uh, his mother in that photograph. That's the one at the head of the stairs, which Rita Duffy picked. Yes, Alan? Just, do you think it could have been Lizzie Keys, who's the one standing behind all the children in the previous photo? Uh, I'm very excited if that might be her. It might mean her. Uh, well, Lena Cage was quite young at that time. No, but the mother. The mother, so yes. Second wife. It, possibly. Because that would be very exciting. But I have the, the, the details if you, yeah, if you don't have a look. Um, 
And here's Buffville in his full company. Again, this is the market yard, Stravan. You can recognize him, all right. Um, then um, circus art on living wagons, an interesting example from the same period. Uh, rather a nice photograph with the child and so on on the, on the steps of the wagon. Um, very small wagon. Uh, members of the Duffy family in uh, the market yard, Stravan. This is Tom Duffy's father, James Duffy. This is uh, John Duffy II. This is uh, Jimmy McLean, who was married to their sister. Um, uh, so he was actually a Scottish music hall comedian originally. Um, and then if we go on, uh, this one is, uh, there's a big split in the Duffy family and three separate Duffy circuses emerged in 1917. This is the John Duffy version uh, in, uh, with Mr. and Mrs. Duffy in the middle uh, in the market yards to van. Um, and then if we look at this one, that's another circus around this period, Chadwick Circus, which actually Yates visited and, and uh, drew and painted. Um, originally calling themselves Heckenbergs briefly, then the first word war broke out and they had to change back <laughs> to Chadwick's. Um, this is um, a Duffy Circus again, 1916, or one of the Duffy Circuses, the Double Jockey Act. Uh, James Duffy on the left, there you recognize him, or you can recognize him. Um, then um, one of the breakaway groups, 1917 to 20, Wilson and Duffy, uh, Arthur Wilson, Scottish guy, who was married to um, uh, Phyllis Duffy, one of, the, one of the Duffy family, who was touring in our own show. But there are a few slightly worrying things in this photograph. Um, <laughs> I'm not elaborate. Um, <laughs> the past is a different country, they do things differently there. Anyway, um, some more, uh, just to close, some more examples of uh, some of the wonderful um, pieces of art on display currently at the NGI. Uh, an art, Irish artist well known, Irish artist Manny Jellett. Um, and there's a very interesting sequence showing how she produced this painting. It, you can see her initial drawing and then finally her um, uh, wash uh, on paper and the final uh, product as it were. Carvinio Circus. Um, I'm sure you've seen those wonderful Father Brown photographs of the Titanic. He was a, a Jesuit priest who was an early pioneer of photography uh, in the uh, early 20th century. Boarded the Titanic in Cherbourg, got off fortunately for him in Cove uh, before it all went pear-shaped. Uh, and uh, uh, he was a great pioneer of photography. This is a Father Brown photograph from the 1920s, probably, of Corvinio Circus. Uh, the McCormick family still have three small touring shows in the west of Ireland this year, uh, touring small villages um, uh, with uh, tents, or they work sometimes in halls. Um, one, one group is called Circus Corvini, another group is called Circus La Reina, Another group is called Circus Rosario. Very small shows, just single family, um, which is uh, quite interesting. <coughs> so that tradition survives. Johnny Quinn, the last of the singing clowns, <laughs> Duffy Circus, 1930s. But Helen has researched him as well because he's an interesting example of an Irishman who volunteered to go to the First World War, served in the Munster uh, Fusiliers, <coughs> survived Gallipoli, came back joined uh, the circus, made a career out of it, um, died in England in, in Clacton uh, in 1950. Uh, but uh, he is very much the traditional clown in the traditional clown costume, uh, as you can see. Um, Fawcett's, well, it would take me another uh, hour or so to go into their history, but um, in the 1930s they used this Heckenberg title, they revived it. Um, and uh, uh, for a number of seasons called themselves Heckenbergs. Um, and uh, as you can see, uh, quite an elaborate show front and quite a big show by the 1930s. 
uh, three mass big top. Um, uh, there are some programs over there if, if you're interested. Um, the founder, well, on the Fawcett side, the founder, Edward Fawcett, had come to Ireland in 1917 um, because the Fawcett's originally <coughs> were a famous English um, circus dynasty. Um, here they are in rural Ireland. This is only the motorised transport. They were still using horses mm -hmm. for the living wagon. <coughs> in rural Ireland in 1939. Uh, 1942, still going despite the difficulties of the war um, and uh, all of that, uh, though not in the north because uh, John Duffy's toured for one season after the outbreak of the war in the north, but um, quite difficult <coughs> uh, for sure circuses to tour in the north because of blackout restrictions and other difficulties. But there were Christmas circuses, including that of Dr. Hunter, whom Brett will be telling, telling you all about shortly. And here are uh, three of James Duffy Sr., the guy you saw in the writing act earlier and in the market yards to ban three of his sons in a publicity still taken for the Belfast Telegraph in 1944 to promote the Christmas circus at the Hippodrome. That's Tommy Duffy in the middle, this is Arthur, and that's Billy. Um, uh, Billy and Arthur are both, alas, dead now, but only still go on uh, at um, 89 years. And up until this season was touring with the show. Um, some more examples of um, circus art. Uh, this is again on display in the NGI at the moment. And by the way, you can see the Donnybrook Fair painting, not in that exhibition, but in a room close to it. Uh, it takes half an hour really to, to study it in full. Yeats, of course, painted a whole series with circus related uh, themes. Here he is with the last dawn but one, a circus pulled down. By that stage in the 1940s, his painting isn't very realistic, it's very impressionistic. Um, famous. Cavalier, Cavalier's Farewell to His Steed from 49. He was quite depressed by the late 1940s. His wife had died um, in the Second World War. He had found quite a traumatic experience as well. That grand conversation was under the rose. You have the, the Lady Rider, the, the clown, um, uh, Marion and other members of the Fawcett family would say that uh, the rider and the horse was modelled on uh, a horse that uh, her grandmother Mona, uh, Edward Fawcett's wife, uh, had in the 1920s and 30s called Liney. Features in a number of Fawcett programmes. Mary Swansea's Climb by Candlelight. A, a more modern one, 2008. Uh, those who know their circus big tops will immediately recognise one of Circus Vegas's big tops. 2008, uh, painted by Martin Gale. Um, there we go. Also, the, in the exhibition in, in Dublin, you will see, as Yeats collected circus posters, and so there is a, a fabulous collection of both English and, and Irish circus <coughs> posters. Lord John Sanger, Scots, those are English shows during his period of residence in England. You would have seen those, along with his friend, the poet John Macefield who was another circus fan, uh, and these Irish ones, Duffy's Circus and Chadwick's Circus. And notice the Duffy Matograph, moving pictures, obviously being used as a, an attraction. Chadwick's Circus, um, which is around 1914-15. Uh, sketches from the Yates Archive um, of circus scenes. He filled whole sketchbooks with the with these. <coughs> um, Barnum and Bailey program from the European tour, which he obviously saw in Britain. In 1909, uh, Duffy's uh, Variety Circus Sunbook, uh, with Annie Duffy listed there in the role of women as the sole proprietor uh, after the death of her husband, uh, uh, John Duffy uh, the, the first. Uh, so somewhere between 1909 and 1913. So uh, all of those 
are uh, just giving you a flavour of that exhibition on in Dublin at the moment if you want to. Go down on the train, um, check out the National Gallery of Ireland website <coughs> and have a look at it. This was an idea I had in January when the snowy day and I thought wouldn't it be great to have a look at circus archives in Prony and you know when people got in touch about Circus 250 I went and spoke to people in the Belfast Community Circus School and an idea came out of that and some work got published and so on. So it's really a great pleasure for me personally to see us all here because I'm, I'm an archivist in Prony, worked with a lot of circus material over the last few years. We have two collections uh, and it's just a treat to get it out there and let people see it. So the two collections I'm going to really uh, talk about today is Richard mentioned earlier on the Cooper collection, which is primarily a collection of uh, photographs from about 1910, 1920, and they really just offer insights into a travelling circus, life in Ireland at that time, particularly around the Straban Northwest area where uh, the Cooper, where the boroughs that the photographer at that, that time was, was based, the studio was based. But they do offer real insights, they're really striking, they have a naturalism and they have an energy that I particularly enjoy, and they're extremely rare. So I won't, I just kind of have to do this talk be finished by four, so we'll probably have to shorten it and have to fire through a few things. The main collection I'm looking at is, is the Dr. Hunter Circus Papers, who again was briefly mentioned in the, in the previous talk, and I'll be kind of focusing on that, we'll come to that soon. Okay, so again, the, the title of this, this thing is Samson and, and Banana. I thought it was being clever, thinking of Harlan Wolf called Samson and, and Banana being a famous old Belfast clown. Uh, from 1930s and 40s, so I kind of thought I'd tie that up, but, uh, but obviously no one laughs, you know. <laughs> I thought it was good. <laughs> so, here we go. Again, I'd just like to see this. This is the photograph that you've all seen and when you come in the building to see it, but it's just such a fabulous, striking photograph. And it is really great when people do come in the building go upstairs and see that. It's one of the most prominent images inside the atrium here. So again, the Buff Bills, L looking at Straban, around about 1911 to about 1914, so these, these really offer insights, some of you have seen, seen, seen before. D1422 is the Cooper collection, which these photographs are part of. Cooper, uh, the studio had photographed everyday life in Straban, but one of the, one of the things they were really into was, the, was the, the entertainment, leisure, circuses come, that comes under that. Travel, you've seen that before. Uh, Duffy Circus, famous old family there to this day some of the performers there. So it's just really, these offer sort of rare insight to, to life and it's very, it's sort of provincial areas of, of Ireland but they're just so rare to have them and I think they, they really, I'd love to fire through these a bit quick because I'm on time limit here. Again, pretty good time master. It's interesting, that's a first like a talk sign in the back of my slip. It's troubling. But you get some idea of the life and the kind of, the kind of toil of, of actually the physicality of actually you know, the start to show on. Uh, particularly in 1911, you know, it, does, it doesn't have a lot of hard graft. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's Buff Bills, Dixie Girls, and you get some idea of how well turned out they are and, and, and the colours and you can just imagine them, the show and the, and the laughter and the noise. Okay, you've seen that one before, you've seen that one before. Just gonna quickly fire through these ones here. I like this, because you can kind of play it back a bit. <laughs> so yeah, Mar Mars is fun with this, you know. It's the best technology I have to try and move the images along. It's just some of the interactions, some of the, the performances, and I, I do find, I just find the photographs have a real, a real energy to them, a real naturalism that I, that I really enjoy. It's beautiful, they, they really are. Even the composition, you know, fantastic. That's really interesting because you do get some idea, again, this is from Stra Straban in 1911, and some idea of what, what it means to the local population, particularly children, the circus comes to town. There's many famous writers who have written about the circus, and Gabriel Mar Marquez had said something on it, you know, when there's nothing beats the excitement of it. It is just, you know, four people living in a group, provincial town, colour and, and everything that that brings that are, it's just, you can just get some idea of the excitement of the, Children, I'm not sure they kept in line there. So the frame, but there is certainly a buzz about it. <clears throat> Again, some of the per performers. It's just just showing the wide range of of acts and talents in the circus. I'm sure you do that. Go. I'm coming back. That's the that's just the fabulous one. Funny George, you know. So they're all singing with tears of the line. It's just something really really striking about it. <clears throat> 
Right, so that was just a quick run through. There's some of the Cooper photographs that have been mentioned in the previous talk, and what I, I would like people to see. The main kind of focus of my talk today will be about Dr. Hunter, who was, who was this person's life. It's just incredible. I mean, if this was, this was fiction, you would think, oh, it's far-fetched. I mean, there's someone who was seriously born in British Guyana in 1884. His mother brought him to Port Glen Glenown, County Antrim. <laughs> Death of his father, he went to Balamina, serves an apprenticeship, local drapery trade. At the age of 30, he became a salesman in the drapery trade. After the First World War, he was a hospital orderly with the French Red Cross. After one year, he was injured, transported home. Uh, then he's an interest in medicine, 30, 31 years old, working amongst the sick, experience he got in the First World War. So when he, went, when he became fit again, he went to Queen's University, granted his application for a scholarship, Faculty of Medicine. He granted undergraduate, postgraduate degrees in anatomy, before coming to lecture, and then the Secretary of the University. His portrait hangs to the day in Queen's in this great hall. But aside of his sort of academic work, what his real love and interest was for was, was for the for animals, and then to work in the circus. He was made curator of Belfast Zoo, 1937. This guy's career is going just all over the place. <laughs> but it's just remarkable. You know, you think that would happen first week, you know, fighting orderly in the First World War, Portland home, Drapery salesman, next thing you're in France, next thing you're the curator of Belfast Zoo, you're in Queen's University, he's flying over the place. But then he did, he did have this kind of real, real love, love of animals, and he went to England to meet the Chipper Finn Circus family in 1938. And then he had the opportunity to become a stand-in uh, ringmaster. And he was apparently so good that Ch Chipperfield asked him if he'd consider becoming a full-time ringmaster for their circus. So this was, this was something that, you know, he, he was, uh, had a natural, had a love for this. Uh, he declined the, the request, but obviously it died in cast. I mean, he decided to fulfill his interest, he'd have to try and open a circus in Belfast. I think about what he could do with circus. So this happened on Christmas Day. The first circus that Hunter, Dr. Hunter put, put on in Belfast was in uh, was, was 1940. So this is this is the backdrop to the Second World War. War. And Dr. Hunter's Christmas Circus really became such a part of the feature of the land, landscape there. And we'll just we'll just have a look at some shots of that there. But these are some of the artists that he had brought to Belfast. Yodeling Rangers. <laughs> Sounds slightly ominous. <coughs> Not sure what's going on there. Jack Mayan. Incredible just performance, you know. You can see the detail of that, but it's just. There's always in Belfast going, what is this? This is <laughs> something fantastic, you know. Amazing. Parallel. What is? It's just, yeah, it's just incredible. But again. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That one, yes. No. That's that. Yeah. Royal Hippodrome. The Royal Hippodrome, which was Great Victoria Street Prison, or sorry, Great Victoria Street, which became the Hippodrome Cinema and the New Vic Cinema from, and then was, uh, was bombed, but was, that, was bombed by the IRA in 1974, and then got back on feet again, and then the theatre was was a bingo hall, and then the bingo seats in 1996. So a building is having a lustrous That's the old ABC path. then. Right. Just beside... Next to the old ABC. Yeah. Next to the old ABC. <laughs> it's Fitzwilliam Hotel, isn't it? Yeah. That's yeah. right, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Three, the three Dubskis felt <laughs> woman's craziest clients, which, uh, sorry, I missed that one. Again, it's something kind of very slapstick, very physical art. You can just feel a lot of texture been going on, just the chaos of that there. But, I mean, I think, even to put these on during wartime is, is probably is a, an amazing challenge. You know, he said, you know, Dr. Hunter in his memoir says, a great problem before three people, G.L. Birch, Jack Thilino and myself, who would be responsible for the circus? Faced with courage and determination, this is during 1941 after the Belfast Blitz of the Luftwaffe in April 1941. Are they going to put a circus on or not at Christmas 1941? So short of the actual theatre being blown sky high by the enemy, a circus would be produced for the entertainment of such of the population which remained and for the troops stationed in Belfast. So there's a real commitment to these shows. Uh, again, the, with, with circus from its time, with, with animals being used at that time. And this is one of the photographs of the banana the clown. I'm reliably informed, which is just a lovely striking image. 
Ben Duffy. Duffy? Yeah. 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 James. One of the James Duffy. One of the James, yeah. James, James Duffy. Duffy. <coughs> right. So that's Christmas 1940. That's the Royal Head Head Drum, which is now the hotel. So it's not the merchant, is it? It's the Fitzwilliam. It's 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 just on the corner. It's where all of these shows have taken place. And again, Dr. Hunter uh, talks about circus, about such affection. And, you know, as a grown man, he says, I'm still a boy at heart. And feel the thrill of excitement, the mere sight, the brightly coloured bills, which announce the approaching visit of a circus. This is deep love of it. And so what I particularly like, and as well as photographs in this collection, there's, there's some lovely illustrations and circus posters, which are just so vibrant and, and striking. And I do have a few of them here, I'd like pe people to see. So again, it's one of the Christmas shows, Dublin's kind of circus for season only. It's new, not all exciting. That's, uh, that's the Grove Theatre, so that would have moved to the Shore Road then. So that's his in name only, because Dr. Hunter's not active, particularly in 1967, for health, health reasons. But the name of the of the endeavour is still there, though it's moved out now. The Grove Theatre, just people like, like that one. We actually used that in Prony for Christmas for a document of the month feature, which got a bit of local press and stuff, because I just always find that really. Fabulous image. <clears throat> Again, the Nice Look by the Christmas Circus, the Grove Theatre. Just this collection of just the colours and the and the imagery these I really love. But there's also ones when when, when Dr. Hunter would have travelled after the war to try and book acts, to try and bring people to to perform in Belfast. He would have travelled widely and also taken in a lot of local circuses, uh, circus performances, and you know, a great collector, a great collector of posters and ephemera, memorabilia, and we're lucky to have these now here because they really are striking. <coughs> it's Pinder Circus in Dundor. This one again that's split on the wall of the back. There's a copy of that one. Really smart. Uh, also some of the some of the uh, newspapers some, some of the cuttings he, he collected on his travels I find really fascinating. And particularly this idea in, in Ireland during the Second World War that there was sort of German spies performing in circus troops or in circus bands, and I think it's, a, it's an academic area that's really un, under research, you know. There's, for, for example here, the German pictures in this trapeze barn. So this, may, this is from, this is a case in England, I think, in 1940, where German trapeze artist was unscrewing his chromium bars when a stream of photographic film fell out. <laughs> Rather a neat way of storing exposed film, thought 48-year-old Gerald Portlock, a Shropshire-born circus artist. This is a year ago now, Mr. Portlock linking up the odd things he saw in the sawdust world. Some of these incidents did not seem very important at the time, he said yesterday. But after reading last Sunday's Sunday Express, I'm not so sure that some of the German performers were as innocent as they seemed. <laughs> this is a whole world of these sort of circus performer spies, which I, which I, just, I just love that, you know. And he was on to say, uh, sort of, there was enough, there, there was also a German who presented a performing sea lion act. Everybody thought he was all right until some blueprints were found hidden beneath the floor of a sea lion's cage. <laughs> The, that's Fawcett's wartime circus, and that's the motorised transport. He does have that, just some idea of the size of it there. Uh, there's also some interesting things that he came across, just sort of, because this circus, this Christmas, Dr. Hunter's Christmas Circus, so born really came out the Second World War. And, uh, you know, this kind of thing, the circus is propaganda, as allied propaganda. I mean, this is fascinating. And, you know, saying, do a low level over Belfast, Jack, and see what's coming to the world. Have a drum at Christmas. <laughs> you know? It's just me. And there, 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 there's, there's a few of these are just fantastic. There's, there's another one. I'll just read them out because I have them here. It's again, it's something like, uh, good, just as I thought, another great show. We must book our seats early. <laughs> yeah, it's really amazing stuff, you know. <clears throat> There's a few of these. Now this is this is the sort of the truth at last. Goebbels, you know, announcement made by the Fuhrer. It stated that Rudolf Hess fled to Britain in order to book his seats early for the world. Why is this not research? We were circus is propaganda during the Second World War. 
of a Christmas circus show. It's just a couple of others. I just find them really fascinating. And again, uh, they say they are surrendering now. They stand a better chance of seeing the Royal Hippodrome monster <laughs> Christmas service. You know, your Mussolini Emperor Hirohito, I guess, and then Adolf Hitler himself. So it's really incredible stuff. So, kind of looking at some of the international circus posters that Dr. Hunter had in his travels had collected. And you, it, it's interesting, just purely artistically, you see different styles, and even, even particularly ones from Eastern Europe as well, you see a very kind of Soviet kind of style on them, so they're, they're quite artistic. So it's a French one, I guess, it's a Baltimore Civic Center, more of a sort of, looks like the of the horse, that one actually. <laughs> Again, kind of old school ones, this is a Circus Scott, I'm not sure where that's from. Maybe. Sweden. <coughs> that's from Sweden, okay, thank, thank you for that. Circus Delight. That one. There is a collection. That's a Prague one, 1966. It's a beautiful image. Again, it's very, very, very harsh, very straight lines, very old Soviet kind of style. But as a circus poster, you must it's very original and it's very different. And something that really, really draws the eye. So, I mean, a circus in Prague, Communist era, 1966, I'm sure, had some show. You know. Torino, an Italian one. So, we end that whole. That whole celebration, that tradition of clowns and comedy del art and so on, you know, again, kind of very evident there. Just a very different uh, design. And like some of the some of the European ones are very uncluttered, but some of the American ones, the British ones, just put as much image imagery as they can. Or some of the European ones are just very, very quite sparse, which I like that about them. <coughs> the French ones, slightly <laughs> racing, but colourful, uh, a piece of art. <laughs> okay, it's, it's a poster. <laughs> the, greatest, the, the greatest show on earth comes to my Miami Beach Convention or Convention Hall, 1965. That's that's one of my favourites there. Circus Theatre in Paris. <clears throat> Again, just just a really colourful image. Again, so there's a lot going on on that, you know. <laughs> called show coming the time thing there. I like that one too. I like that one. The design of it. Again, the reference to Philip Philip Astley, London, 1768, 200th anniversary pro program. So no, that's that's a that's an interesting one as well. <laughs> so it's just it's just so good, you know. In an archive to have these, not just I mean the local photo photographs of, of Circus of Belfast Fabulous, but to have we and an international dimension to it from, from the collecting of Dr. Hunter. It's actually that's a notepad or is it the writing paper, but I kinda like it as well. I love ephemera, I love stuff that people throw throw out, you know. Again, okay, another Prague one. It's very, very straight. Interesting image. <laughs> so, Dr. Hunter also was, was mentioning about circus in Ireland, and he was kind of interested because he'd met so many international circus performers and so many had came to Ireland. If you had came to Ireland from the European International Circus Circuit, as it were in 1920, I'll try 19. 40s and 50s, and a few of them stayed. And he writes a really, I was reading his memoir and just getting some background to his life, and it was a really interesting little piece, or little paragraph he came across. And just his circus in Ireland, and it said that, hang on, it's more that. It just says, there's a strange magnetism and fascination about Ireland for Rosie Mayne, who was a European circus performer in the 1930s, right through very famous in, in the circus world, is not only the only great artist who has come under its spell and remained to spend the rest of their lives following the circus wagons through its enchanting hills and valleys, following the will of the wisp of happiness, through good weather and bad, through times of trouble and times of peace, through the land of fairies and banshees, bound as if by chains to its misty mountains, its misty lakes and its hospitable and kindly people. Prose that, you know. <laughs> and then he mentions Georgie Knight, another great circus artist who has come, who has come under the spell of Arm, like Rosie Mayne. He has appeared in many of the great circuses of Europe. He spent several seasons in South Africa. I love this line. 
and now he's found a permanent home following the wagons of Irish circus dump. It's quite, it's quite impressive stuff. It's like flooring, but I do, I do like it. Yeah. So just some other pho photographs from Dr. Hunter's circus papers uh, of a lot of performers in Belfast in the 1940s, 1950s, round about that time. And you know, if you photograph this in real time with real cameras, you know, it is quite a quite a feat. Again, the animals and circus the bit we, we know and it, it's controversial and it's, it's kind of going the right way around the world now. But there was from its time, you know, these photographs are very much from their time and the imagery is striking. <clears throat> Things like that. Let <laughs> me tell me what that is. Flexible. Is like bone? It's bamboo. Bamboo. Yeah. Three sticks. Yeah. 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 Likewise, scooters are just kind of parked aside and they'll be picked up later, later on during the show. <laughs> And just going to quickly run through a few photographs that, that we have. Also, again, with the Strabane ones very much from 1910 to about 1920, and these ones bring it up to about 1940, 1950. So, again, getting a sense of these, these live shows. And I'll just mention briefly some of these performances in Belfast. So, for example, 1955. <laughs> Just to give you a kind of idea of who was on the lineup and what you would have got for your for your four pence in or, or whatever it costs, you know, to see who was on the bill. And these these are truly international flavors. Whether the people were from there, I don't know. But anyway, we have 1955. We have Silvio and his golden harp. Kicks things off. We have the two bars, a gymnast from Russia. We have an Oriental Oriental foot jugglers, Abdullah and Saida. We have Miss Mary, Queen of Ballerinas. We have the five Vavolnias, the world's greatest cycling act, from Leipzig. We have Dolly's Dogs, the greatest dog act of all time, from Copenhagen. We have so many Copenhagen's in the house. <laughs> <laughs> and no circus would be complete without the two Milanes. Oh, right, these are also billed as Poland's craziest clowns. So Poland had a lot of crazy clowns in the 1950s. <laughs> and it also says Belfast had Belfast never seen anything like, like this. So you were getting quite an international lineup, you know, for your money in 1955. That's a fabulous one as well. Wow. It's just amazing. It's just stunning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just the best. It's just the challenge. Uh, sorry, I don't have names for each performer. Um, your bullets. Who? <laughs> Gerbolas. Gerbolas? Yeah, they're a family. I'm so, I'm, I'm so glad you're sitting here. You can come to my next talk with you. Uh, they're probably presently still running a show in Ireland. Right. Mm -hmm. um, descendants of those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much in the thick of it there. Far, far away there. Far. Oh, there's a knife throw in the back line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you start looking at these photographs to see what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Any ideas? Mm -hmm. Richard, no, that would be. <laughs> and so this is this is this is Des and Adam the in here at the end because we do have two collections in front of you. We're hopefully getting some more circus circus material from Helen, who will be speaking next, and that would just really complement the holdings, the archival holdings that we have, which are kind of pretty much from the 1900s till about 1960s, and to bring that up to date would be. Fantastic, and would also reckon, you know, would uh, acknowledge the changes there's been in circus with the advent of Belfast Community Circus School and things like that. And I had the whole ethos on how circus, why traditional circuses are still important and still run, and how circus has a whole new audience now and a whole new focus, as it were. So that's pretty much it. So thanks for your time and thanks for coming. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. BC before circus. <laughs> and uh, before circus, I was a child in Africa who had absolutely no clue about circus. There were these scary puppets at church, and there were ventriloquist puppets preaching at us. That was scary. That wasn't circus. But that was the kind of performing arts that I knew apart from, um, I don't know, later on in Waringstown, when I moved to Waringstown, amateur dramatics. But I've never seen a circus. I'd heard about them obviously knew the word, but I'd never seen a circus until I kind of joined one. 
So Attention, me. please. No documents will be issued after 4.15 p.m. It would be appreciated if actions no longer required are immediately issued as as soon as possible. Thank you for your cooperation. Okay. Right then. I don't know why I've got a green face, but it's envy because I haven't met Circus yet. Okay. Um, so, Star Wars Day. So the, I don't know why it happened, but on the 4th of May, 1994, I touched a trapeze for the first time, and the force was strong with me. <laughs> and it really was, it really did feel like that. But I touched a trapeze, and I was jealous for it. I didn't want anyone else to touch the trapeze. Not Maeve, who was nine, or K Kiva, who was probably ten or twelve, or something like that at any age. But all this lineup of children from the youth circus were there and I touched a trapeze, that was my turn, and I loved it, okay? So, I had done flamenco classes at the Crescent Art Centre, which is uh, an art centre down in town there, and I tried something new. And I think that everything um, maybe follows a reason, but sometimes it's just seriously random, and it was, for me, the first thing about circus that I've ever met. So, thank you, Belfast Community Circus. Um, my first encounters were really with the remarkable Jennifer Dempsey as my circus teacher, aerial teacher. And in 1994, I think Paul, you started around then as well, didn't you? And um, she seemed to have this really charismatic relationship with the children, which included um, cheerleading and warm-ups, which were very dynamic. And you know, it was almost like the cult of Jen, um, which was infectious. And her sort of enjoyment of the children um, was based on her experience in a circus in her elementary school with a man called Mr. Moyer, who was the physical education teacher. And he had invested really his whole life in the children and the extracurricular activities of the children in his school. And Jennifer and her siblings and there are five of them in the Dempsey family in America were really recipients of this passion for circus and passion for young people and physical activity. So Jennifer had this thing, she came to Belfast to read English um, on, a, on an exchange at Queen's and uh, ran away to the circus instead, <laughs> and stayed. Um, <coughs> the photograph on the right is from um, a geographic magazine that I seem to have a copy of somehow. It was like National Geographic but the young person's um, version and there was a whole article in it that I unearthed in my archive so I'm depositing that with the um, archives here. <coughs> so debut's first touch of trapeze. Um, my debut was after four months of touching a circus I was in the air performing and it really kind of begs the question of what, what's, what circus for and for me it was a way for me to reclaim my physicality um, to transfer my desire to be a dancer when I was little um, which wasn't realized and for me to be a performer and I didn't really like talking and I certainly couldn't memorize lines and I had four lines once in a school play and I couldn't remember them, but I knew what the point of the lines were, but I couldn't remember them. I just can't read, really. So, um, the debut was an exciting thing where I could put an artistic um, thing together with Jennifer, my teacher, which meant that I progressed really quite quickly. Um, uh, and we were the hazy daisies at Thompson's Garage. Um, and this was my first outing as a costume designer, which included making daisies to put on our bras, um, with blue sparkles and white felt petals. Um, and I think, Paul, you were, in, were you in that show as well? I think we earned something like 12 pounds. Between us. Between us. Yeah. <laughs> we were juggling cowboys. Yeah. So it, it was a bit of an experiment, I think, to do this, um, this, this cabaret, and it went on um, through that autumn of 1994. There were several editions of it, and it seemed to be quite popular. We even got into the local magazine, like Northern Woman or something like that. So uh, 
I was a graphic designer working in Belfast, and the Crescent Art Centre was more or less directly opposite where I was working. And the other thing that was exhibited at the time were people who were just about to be married and were tied to the lamppost and tarred and feathered kind of thing. You know, that, that kind of spectacle was the only street performance I had seen up until that point. Um, but across the road was the Crescent Arts Centre and the circus office, and Anne McReynolds was the development officer at the time, and Jennifer being the artistic director. And actually, I never mixed school, but I did bunk off work quite often, or more than I should have extended lunch hours, and go to the circus office and do training. And so in that first year, um, I really became a volunteer with the circus, um, whether they wanted me there or not. And I worked um, in, was it St. Kevin's, which is the name of the hall? Mm -hmm. St. Kevin's Hall, which was um, just in the centre of town, and it was a big church <coughs> room, there were about... 80 people would come, parents and children, and there would be a carousel way of learning skills. But the amazing thing for me was that young people were involved in the teaching as well as adults, and whoever had got a skill would share it. Um, there is a book about 20 years of circus, and in the beginning of that there's the minutes, which was talking about health and safety and how to put on stilts and all of those kinds of things that could have precursor of problems that can ongo for health, health and safety. But anyway, I kind of came in as a as a novice, but also an enthusiastic person, and I think an an an, an organisation that can welcome enthusiasm is really a, a precious thing, you know. Because I don't think I would be where I am without that welcome. If it had just been a purely functioning thing about take my money for my class and then progress, then you know, this circus wouldn't be what it is, and my circus wouldn't be what it is. <coughs> <coughs> the training places in Belfast at the time were borrowed spaces. Um, the Crescent Arts Centre was absolute shambles in terms of a building with lots of areas condemned, full of um, uh, freezing cold offices with condensation on the windows and drawers you shouldn't really go through and at one point the wall cracked because the train went past and then the wild show um, got evicted but that was further down the line. Um, I think in 95 we got into the Fountainville Street. I'm a bit hazy about names and places so correct me but there was a building there um, that we could get into and that was much more convenient to the present and the classes moved to there so I think that's that building. And if it's not, I have no idea where it is. It's Fountainville Church, yes, just across the road from the Crescent Arts Centre. Yeah. Um, and it was it was a chance for adults for the first time, or perhaps for the first time in the memory of the people saying it was adults for the first time, but maybe not the first time in the history of the circus school, because there were adults who had trained at the beginning, or a resurgence of adults having a chance to have a go. And Anita Woods, who was performing before, and her sister and several others, um, who are um, still working in circus at the moment came to those classes um, that Jennifer and I were teaching. And at around this time, we had Joe Williams join us. Uh, the adult class um, was invited to join with Down to Earth group in Dublin for the St. Patrick's Day parade. And this is a picture of us, the adults on stilts. Yes. And um, this is, I think, the first time, I don't know if Ken's still in the room, but this may be the first time that we met. Um, and this was the first opportunity for me to see street performance and large community scale street and circus um, in Ireland or anywhere really. So this was an extraordinary thing because I'd come from um, living in Waringstown and Lurgan where street mm. activities were different. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely no creative output at all and in fact if you're an artist you're really weird and if you had an English accent you were, you know, were, I was really weird because yes I wasn't from really from there except my dad was. So these um, I couldn't really find a good portrait of Donald, so I 
got one off the internet yesterday. But, um, Mike Maloney and Donal were the founders of the circus school, and that's Martin Law, who's the one in the middle. But um, I think it's quite an interesting thing to look at two people who come from a theatrical background who've appropriated circus in a way as a really interesting tool for um, working with young people. And I think I just wanted to make sure that in this conversation, um, all this talk that we remember that two people can make a massive difference and the people that they um, inspire can make even more of a difference. And both of them were around at the time that I started. Donal had an office beside um, the circus school's office in running an agency so I got the occasional job there including Top Hat and had some exciting experiences working with Donal in parades on stilts, walking roads which had flooded and getting lifts on the top of cars because the whole parade had gone and we had been abandoned and things like that, you know, the funny things that happen. Helen, I just wanted to say it's really interesting because because back then Mike and Donal were almost the poster boys of circus yeah. and you forget that, uh, that actually Nora Greer was behind the scenes. Yeah doing all the bits of paperwork that maybe Do Mike and Donald weren't necessarily interested in doing. So there was actually, if we think about it, it was probably three people that really yeah, founded yeah, the Belfast yeah. Circus School. And I think, I think that's, that's something that, um, that is, is something that I really want to acknowledge and Nora's here, so thank you very much for that. Um, Like I said, I'm not the expert, but I think that um, this is a job for you guys to do. You've done, in some ways, you've done to 2005 in the book that you did for your 20th anniversary. You've got a bit more time now to, to fill in. Um, but I just for those people who aren't part of the community circus, this is a brief timeline of some of the um, landmarks. What I found interesting in kind of looking back was that how quickly um, this, the school became international or internationally recognised as some people have called it a frontier circus, um, a circus with an agenda which has social ambitions for an art form and for the practice of arts being uh, having a dividend which is beyond the acquisition of skills. Um, and to, to attend the first international festival of circus in London where you meet our chaos and Cirque du Soleil, that's pretty incredible. Um, and for those people to recognise a community organisation like that very quickly um, shows that the school was in the forefront of a movement which was international, that um, this wasn't a backwater um, catching up, it was leading. So I think that's a really impressive thing um, that the school can be proud of. It also worked in different fora, so it worked in in community spaces out there and in community spaces in there so with people who were confined or who were struggling to get out so circus one to three was working in a st patrick's training school and i remember working with those kids and it was a really amazing thing working in a social context working with social workers and circus artists working sometimes two workers with one child but that was very meaningful we had some long gone we was, um, very important in that. And I think most of us who were teachers at the time, voluntary or professional, had a real, really interesting time working in those um, environments, particularly if they were interested in burning the petrol in your petrol tank. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 1995, Jo Williams joined us. She was fresh out of um, circus spaces training. And then in 96, Will Chamberlain was appointed as director of the school. Um, and I'm really brushing, that o brushing over fast forward, but 1999, the building opened, and in 2000, the first graduates from the training school, which I think professionalised a co whole cohort of ch children, young adults, and older adults into the professional sphere. And one of those was Anita. I think, did Anita do that? That one? Yeah. And, and then the first festival of fools. Um, all groundbreaking really, so hats off to you guys. Um, this is a painting I did for Jennifer um, a long time ago, which um, 
kind of try to, because I was trained as an illustrator, to illustrate what the mission of the school was, um, to bring the community together, to bring the community to a neutral space, to make um, links which were about common practice rather than division. And that started from the very first workshop, I believe, in the Formo Recreational Centre, which where people were bussed in. So I think, um, for me, as a 28-year-old starting circus, actually this was true for me as well as an adult, this was the first time I was in a room with people who weren't from my community. You know, how ridiculous is that? Mm. It was the first time that I was able to go to other places in the city because I had permission, because I was with the circus. Mind you, if I'm walking on Falls Road behind a Free the Prisoners of War taxi um, with my accent, I was mute. <laughs> um, but I did get to meet, meet people from all walks of life through circus, and I think this was... Um, A, a unique experience that I don't know which other community in the, in the city provided that or in, the, in, in Northern Ireland at the time. Um, we forget things like, uh, you know, Anita and Claire going out for their first workshop. It was quite dangerous going out with Jennifer actually because <laughs> Jennifer was American and she could do whatever she liked because Americans are cool. Uh, whereas everyone else was not cool because we were local or English speaking or sounding and <laughs> you know so taking taking circus to some communities was quite dangerous and I think Anita and co were like held by the neck on the bonnet of a car um, and you know so it was risky um, but and I had I used to have to still walk with a stick with a ball on the end to swing around me in the markets area to stay <laughs> to stay <laughs> on the line. <laughs> I know, my stilts. I know what you're doing. <laughs> um, I think the template of youth-centred work is um, something that I've um, taken forward with me as well. And I think, um, as an example, it was not the first time I've met an intergenerational community because that happens in other spheres. But I think in terms of skills being acquired because people have got expertise, regardless of how old they are, that is different. Um, and so here, here she's... She was an expert to me as a novice, and I think that's that's really nice. And I think I've taken that ethos forward with the youth circus that I developed in Newcastle. That age is not the issue; skills, skills really is, is the thing. Now, um, circus is an art form. It's not just a practice, a uh, physical thing. Um, so what are the skills for? Now the social aspect of things is one of the outputs, but really the practice of the arts and development of the arts and myself as an artist was something that I really enjoyed. And um, in this picture, you'll see the costume that's over there. Um, and myself and Jennifer doing our beautiful Maria's synchronized swimming act um, in the Queen's Festival Club in the really low ceilinged, dark Crescent Art Centre um, space. Um, and we were synchronised, I believe. And even Charlie Holland from Circus Space said he'd never seen a synchronised act when we went to do it in London. We were like... <laughs> 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 um, but this, this place was great for us to have a chance to get our acts out because I don't know that there were very many other places um, where we could do cabaret. Um, there wasn't, that's, there that's, wasn't, that's there where wasn't, a lot of us cut our teeth. There. And the other place that we did do some performance I remember was the Old Museum Arts Centre, but that was kind of when we curated something rather than it being a venue. But this, this really was our venue 
and where a lot of us cut our teeth on performance. And in the main, it was safe for the audiences, um, except when clubs, fire club swinging was involved, and particularly with Joe and fire club swinging involved, wasn't it? But uh, yeah, it was great, and I think um, this. I learned something about this. This possibly is me nearly dying because. I don't recommend anybody not to do a tech rehearsal with all the things that are involved in an act. I got Jennifer and myself real nose, nose clips. <laughs> and of course it's a smoky venue and the act was seven minutes or something, far too long probably. <laughs> so we were up there gasping because all the smoke was in the, and we couldn't breathe through our noses, had to breathe through our mouths, nearly dying. Then I made different ones then, I just like a decorative nose <laughs> <laughs> um, This act actually has had a second life, and this act has gone on. I made an aerial company in Newcastle, and we took the synchronised swimmers and turned it into a four-person act, and then the youth circus that I developed took the act and reclaimed it as well. So it's had various generations of, of performance of that's quite interesting and it was very interesting as well working with young people who really wanted to acquire the act that we used to do and by doing that they learned the skills that we had and it was a really interesting way for them to go ah I need to get me to hook for this or I need to get this trick for that and it was a really good way if you want a set of skills to be learned especially if it's a teacher's act it was quite a successful way of upskilling quite quickly Anyone remember this woman, Pamela Anderson's name? Tammy's name? So the, the people in the background are the first wave of the adult group, Catherine Hanratty, Anita, myself, Alexa, who's Anita's sister, Laura Workman, and Claire McCausland. And then a guy called Steve from America, who's James Bond. And Pammy Anderson, who has false boobs that I made. <laughs> I can't remember her name. No. I think she came over from London as like the, the one with lots of skills. <laughs> can't remember. Yeah. Anyway, this is at the Lyric. And so we went from developing acts to developing shows. And this is one of Jennifer's ones where we had to audition and so on. So it's called Cirque du Cinema. I think it went to two editions. <laughs> this is, it's not, I don't want to shame anybody. <laughs> um, so it's an interesting thing that it, the encounter of circus for people, sometimes it's celebratory and sometimes it's really confrontational. So here we are, and I'm, I'm one of the deadly sins here, so we're all the deadly sins. And we think we're having a lovely time, but outside there was protest because it was, it was heathen and it was this and, and, and we're all going to hell and all of this kind of thing. And there were people with placards because we were in the club doing Seven Deadly Sins and actually we just had some face paint on, you know. And it was really very tame and I was just doing trapeze. There was a fakir and his um, fire work that was in his butt crack did put my trapeze on fire which I put out with my hands before my act. But other than that, it was really tame. But anyway, he wasn't from Northern Ireland so, you know. Anyway, but this, this thing about... Where circus is confronting me, I think, is something quite interesting because you weave now in circus, or you still think it's just normal, but for other people, they go, What are you doing? Mm -hmm. And you know, so that's something that um, this is the first time that I've met as a circus as a being protested against. And so, taking circus out onto the street became um, something that um, had been done right from the beginning in um, the life of the school. Um, but, you know, for each generation it feels new, so this was, um, this is Jennifer George here, this so is one of her first outgoings as Petals the Clown, and I think this is in the Cathedral Quarter area, um, and we're, we're beginning, I think, beginning to get with the Carnival Parade as well, um, and this is before the Festival of Fools, so this is one of the opportunities how to 
work on the street. So this costume, I've got in a plastic bag somewhere, but they look a bit weird on these like, cat suits. But these costumes were quite fun. So I said to Jen, Jen, as a fountain costume, we could get on that telly program. <laughs> you know, Star Challenge. I bet you we could get some free costumes. <laughs> so I sent, sent Jen off and she went and she applied and we got on. And these costumes were made for us by... Um, they were designed by Dame Edna Everidge's costumier. <laughs> and they were made by the woman who made this cat suit for Poison Ivy in the Batman movie. <laughs> and it was interesting because it was the first time I'd seen somebody painting lycra. Or uh, well, I hadn't seen her make it, but I've gone, oh, that's just painted lycra. I'm an artist. So... Um, and, and really, I had kind of described what they should be designing for us. I said, well, I'm the air, I'm the flyer, and she's like the ground, she's like the base one, and but hey, presto, that's what we got. So we've got the, the, um, the fire and earth and the air kind of elements thing. But Jen and I used to do an act um, with these costumes, again, at the Queen's Festival Club. And this one's actually in Paris. And this is where, I don't know who I was with, because, you know, Jen, you took me on these adventures, and um, we went, and I'm pregnant in this picture. And it was probably my second last performance with Jen. And it, it was a very, very weird um, experience, because I was there with a bunch of people from Belfast, including mural painters, but they were political mural painters who had been in the maze prison, and I was a mural painter painting the empire, you know, like with nice ladies and so on. And I got, I felt really ostracized, so it was a really weird thing, I was like, but I was, I'm not responsible for this context, but, you know, so that's this kind of just a very strange bit at the end of my um, performing with Jen. I'm going to go quite quickly through some of these other images. Um, the Internationalism of Youth Circus is something that um, is, is well established now with lots of exchanges through the school and I was involved in doing some of the recce's for the first exchange um, and then accompanying the school on that expedition, when was it, 98? And then a funny thing happened. Do you know what? A funny thing happened was I went to... Um, and everyone's got anecdotes, but I went to go to become part of the Millennium Dome Circus Show, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't get in because I was too old, because I started when a circus when I was 28, and I wasn't a, like, an 18-year-old gymnast. So I went off and had a baby instead. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is kind of out of context. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of a funny thing happened, dot, 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 all of those anecdotes that people in the room have about circus and the context that they're working in, in this place and this country, write them down. Because they're hilarious. When I first came into the circus, what did I hear? Oh, it was great. I was a tortoise on a skateboard and I was a giraffe. And I, I remember that story and I wasn't even there. You know? Um, so DIY circus. So the next thing is you've got all your skills. What are you going to do? You're going to do it yourself. So I start making costumes and getting out there. And the extreme of my um, <coughs> circus DIY was setting up with Jennifer Jordan and Pierre Mosso Circus Dance Theatre and writing, the first time I'd ever done a funding application, and there's some, some money for the Millennium, and we got 17,000, what's it mean 17,000 pounds? It was a lot of money mm -hmm. um, for our show. Um, and we had, I had given birth, and after five weeks I made 40 costumes, so I had five weeks maternity, 40 <laughs> costumes, painted them, made them, all the designs are in that book, um, there were 40 people on stage, and then the Crescent Art Centre broke. So we went to Will, who'd got a new building, 
And we said, Will, Attention, we need please. to borrow the building. The search room and reading room will close in 15 minutes. Please finish off your research for this evening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, but I think Will found it quite difficult because it's a nice building that he'd really worked hard to get. And here's us rabble going, um, we've got a show. And there was a bit of reluctance on Will's part to let us share his building initially. But we went in and um, we made this show with some of Stephanie Lamoureux, who's up there, who's the swinging... Uh, the aerial teacher from Canada, Ken and Tina are there wearing my painted costumes, and we had these big backdrops, and it was it was pretty amazing performance for a one-off. And I'm so sad that it didn't get another general uh, in um, sort of edition really, but it was quite adventurous really. But that opened in 2000 for three nights, and this is the product. Um, <laughs> of not getting into the Millennium Dome show, um, Freya. Um, and she's performing in a, uh, a tent just outside the, the Crescent Arts Centre um, as Titania, the Queen of the Fairies. So she's, she's not an aerialist. She's 10 months old there. Um, and then I just want quickly to skim, um, just rolling forward. Um, Will Chamberlain came in as quite a, a strong influence and with a lot of um, experience and my, my contacts with Will at the beginning were quite like, like this because I've been volunteering and getting really excited about doing these things and then he came in going, who is this person with no real role doing these things off her own back so I had to be reined in which is kind of normally what I do, I kind of run with things. Um, and we did have, when we were doing Chagall's wedding, breastfeeding meetings. You know, Jen and I both got babies, and then he, I don't know, what's your, what's your sister's name? Yeah. Yes. yeah, so he'd got a baby as well, so there was just these babies all over the place, and um, Chagall's wedding had four breastfeeding mothers in it, and at one point we had wet nursing going on, and it was just like, it was a pandemonium, and it was a new school, and, oh, anyway, but um, I very shortly after that um, show left, um, Northern Ireland and um, then with, I came back in 2004 um, and saw the first of the festival sh full shows that I'd seen but um, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, his, his clowning and street experience and, um, and this festival that came to Belfast has been an amazing thing that, that I've actually not been able to participate in or missed really but it's I think internationally when I am, and it's really built up a community of, of performers um, that, this is Haggis here, I'm not sure who's that there. Charlie. Charlie, Charlie yeah. <laughs> Haggis and Charlie. We see it all now. Well, I was here for Fraser Hooper's show when um, the God Squad came in. Yes. That was the best thing ever. I was really pleased with that because Fraser Hooper's a very demure clown and he was doing a mime show when somebody thought, oh, there's a handy audience to preach to, and came with his ghetto glasses and started <laughs> yeah. preaching, and the audience turned on him, and that was, it was a priceless <laughs> piece of street theatre. Um, so, I think for Mike and Donal, Nora, and for all the people um, that have built the community of circus and taught the skills, there's a massive legacy, and how you document that, and how we acknowledge that is really difficult but um, a lot of the amazing things that I think about the school is actually that people have stayed in Belfast because you don't have to there is a whole massive world over the water with lots of really amazing things <laughs> and you know and it's, it's quite expensive to get across the water it's true but um, but actually you no know, people are choosing to stay and actually the school's been a magnet for people to come and um, make circus here, and I think that's a um, a credit to the power of circus uh, in terms of creating and developing and family and community. Um, so 25 years on, so it's 250 years of circus this year, but 25 years for me, and this is my circus now. And this was this summer, and um, in our little tent, 
which looks massive here because the fish eye at the lens. Um, <laughs> but I, I now am a circus proprietor with a show, with a tent, with a truck, um, with I sponsor artists into the country. Um, it is a family business with my husband, who's the ringmaster there, uh, and my daughter, who's um, now 19. I'll show you a picture in a minute. But um, uh, I identify as anybody to touch a trapeze. It's really, really dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know where it's going to lead you to. Um, it leads you to reunions and circus goes in circles. Um, <coughs> this, this image is from last summer, which is our event, which is called Circus in a Field in um, Guy's Amps, which is a field basically in the middle of the area, in the middle of Northumberland. And to this field, people come from across the world and train together and perform together. And we've had Tumble Circus there, the head first acrobats from Australia and so on. But it's really interesting because we're getting reunions coming now. So um, this development of community, which is beyond borders, is something that the school is doing through its caravan project, through its EU projects. And I think that the whole Brexit issue for circus is going to be quite a challenge in terms of importing artists, but also maintaining relationships, really fluid relationships for this transnational community, where really barriers and boundaries shouldn't be allowed to exist. Um, and here a really good example of intergenerational international circus and circus of choice. And the force is strong in Freya. Um, Freya is 19, she is really the lead aerialist, she's adopted, no, she's she's taken over my costumes <laughs> and she's inherited some of my acts and um, she's better than I ever was and it's and better looking and it's really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I kind of want to leave with a small piece of provocation um, about I did Anthropology of Art as an MA a long time ago, and we were in the 90s in this whole postmodern angst thing, which is like, you can't do anthropology, you can't talk about others, and you can really only talk about yourself, and you know, and all of these things, and then you go like, well, aren't we all one tribe with differences, so that's one thing, but... Having become, in the last few years, a bit more of a circus researcher and becoming more interested in the social history of circus and in war and conflict and all of these things kind of go in and around, I'm kind of now looking at this appropriation and adoption of circus as culture by us who do circus. And I think it's quite an interesting thing because we've had circus in the past as um, a community of people who've worked through inheritance, and yes, there have been jobs and people entering in, but in the main, it's been um, a tradition of inheriting the circus. Whereas now, in the last 30 years, we've been appropriating that culture and actually been quite dominant. And that's, that's in some ways, putting people on the outside who were the circus, you know, so there's this, this interesting thing about how do we be circus together? How do we build those bridges? And I know some people have um, worked in both classic places and community and new circus and there's some antagonism. <coughs> you know, but I think it's just something to question about this appropriation of an art form and cultural practice. Adopting it, becoming it as part of your identity. I really feel circus now. I feel, if, if you said, who are you? I wouldn't say Christian first. I wouldn't say British first. I would probably say circus first. So it's quite an, it, you know, this this thing about who you are and, and who gives you permission to be that and how do you talk about it and when you say that, what does it mean for other people? And being mindful of all of that, I think, is something that I'm trying to just be aware of. And I don't know, I'm not, I'm not saying anything about it, but just as an interesting thing. So now inheritance here with Freya, for instance. 
She's born to circus, and now we've got second generation in the room. Haven't we? You're a second generation circus girl. So this, this is now we're producing this new tradition of circus within this contemporary um, sphere, and I think that's very interesting. So knowing your heritage and your inheritance, both beyond your immediate community to the wider world of circus, and understanding the art form as as a reinvention, and when you discover something the first time, it's very likely that somebody else has discovered that for the first time before you. And to, to just have that modesty and, um, and yes, really, it's very exciting out it's the first time. It's like saying, I found Kilimanjaro and there's snow on the equator. Who knew? <laughs> well, actually, all the them I did, you know? <laughs> all the people down the road knew that there was snow on the equator. Um, and we just called it the equator. So that, that kind of thing, I think, is something for us to be mindful. We've got a great inheritance. We've got something great to share. But we've also um, got a community to bring through. And the public records office here and historians bringing that to light to us, I think, is an amazing thing. And for me, that's really exciting in the last couple of years, going in towards more circademia and discovering this for the first time. But actually, it's rediscovery, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, preserve and share and explore. Thank you very much.